Ja, werte Zuseher, wertes Publikum, wir sollten laut Fahrplan heute eine Person sein. Über Nacht sind es drei Eidgenossen geworden. So, according to the Fahrplan, we should be one person. Um, that became three overnight and uh, we're going to hear them talk about uh, net politics. So, we have uh, Simon here from Digital Society Switzerland in the middle. Uh, Sabrina from CCC Switzerland and then Patrick from the Swiss Pirate Party. L last year we heard about two referendums on mass surveillance and today we're going to find out how these laws um, have been uh, accepted or denied in the referendum and how well how direct democracy worked in this case or not in Switzerland so please welcome Patrick welcome to our small update uh, it's as you said the second time we hear um, I'm happy that uh, this many people are interested so we're going to have a quick look at how referendums work in Switzerland, so you uh, don't get confused by uh, the terminology. Then I'm going to talk about the um, Nachrichtendienstgesetz. Um, we're going to talk about the BÜPF, the other law. And then we're going to look at uh, this one legal case um, about mass surveillance that we have running. And... Um, Briefly, five currently interesting topics that are um, laws that are now debated in uh, the big chamber and small chamber of the Swiss parliament. So in Switzerland, there are three possibilities how a law can come about. One, it could be come from the people, uh, so a national referendum. Then the um, ruling government can pass a law. And in the parliament, you can start a motion, which is going to be treated by the parliament. Then there are these uh, different layers here. And then there's the Vernehmlassung, which is a public request for comments where anyone can basically uh, comment on a law that's in debate in parliament currently. So, to the Nachrichtendienstgesetz. Um, last year we collected signatures for to force a national referendum. Unfortunately, we lost that referendum because we didn't have any money. Nobody wanted to um, invest uh, in into this political fight and it's just not a political climate to be against surveillance laws. So 50% of the people voted uh, yes to this referendum. But uh, one small highlight, the uh, people below 40 voted no. So there's a chance in the upcoming years to do something about this. Little correction, it was 65% of people who voted yes. Welcome to the uh, part about the surveillance law. Boop, uh, please excuse my uh, raw voice. First, I'll tell you about what happened uh, until now. Then I will tell you about the demonstration in 2014 and the referendum in 2016. And then we will be talking about how things may continue. Um, don't make the surveillance state great again is certainly the big thing. And um, that's because in our constitution, we have the right to privacy guaranteed. And unfortunately, um, the law about um, mass surveillance um, named BÜF will violate that. And we've had a law until 2014, which um, allowed a certain extent of mass surveillance and um, preemptive data storage, um, but that 
didn't go far enough. And uh, we, we had a previous presentation, which you can look up online um, with more details about that. This revision of the BIPF um, had included uh, extending the preemptive data storage um, per permission for Trojans and many more. And under the threat of uh, terrorists and uh, more the council, the, the, the parliament, didn't think too hard about it and passed it very quickly. Um, it, so we're not very surprised that there are quotes in the um, newspapers that it was that it was more controversial in the parliament whether to pay um, service providers for what it costs them to provide this mass surveillance than whether or not a federal Trojan is appropriate. Um, when we were talking about the electronic patient, do, uh, patient data, uh, we were invited, but barely anybody um, considered what the actual um, consequences were. So there is also a question about where and how this data should be saved in the future. There are, of course, going to be multiple providers. Uh, well, if, if I flat share and we share an internet connection, then I have to collect data about uh, my flat share mates and uh, can I store that in Africa or so that's still not really quite regulated but it seems it works for them so we said stop we don't want this and uh, from originating from the pirate party we started uh, this motion to um, vote no for the BIPF referendum and also to um, educate the people in the parliament about the technical details of this law. And we were able to bring a lot of other parties on board from left to right across the spectrum. And we want to have a, a serious debate about this law. So this here is uh, what it looks like. So this is the chief of federal police who wants to bring us the uh, govware um, here you see um, signs from the protest but uh, we're in Switzerland so uh, this is also what it looks like um, so let me go back here so 2014 in the, when the Parliament was in session the law should have been discussed we managed to push the discussion one, back one year. But that also meant, well, we had this debate ongoing for an extra year. And uh, in the end, when the parliament voted, it was uh, 160 to 120 for the motion. And we had 100 days for the referendum to force a vote of the Swiss people uh, to collect 50,000 valid signatures. And, but because the NDG uh, law referendum wasn't that far back, a lot of people were exhausted. Um, but I mean, we could, couldn't just let this boop law happen. So we launched the referendum fight anyway. Thank God we managed to uh, find a group um, that supported our referendum. I want to uh, thank the PEP Foundation who donated both time and money. Also, for example, the Suico, who especially uh, financed a large part of our efforts. And uh, of course, thanks to all the individual activists um, who helped here. So we had a new um, big chamber in the parliament and uh, we could hold a press conference in uh, the media room of our parliaments. So uh, <laughs> thank you for helping us organize this. And so that was our 
uh, CCC club room called Rishibach, which uh, was turned into an office basically for for the BIF referendum. And I want to thank Ari for organizing all the the office work there. And so these are uh, helpers here who are sorting these uh, signature documents that we have to file together with the. Digitale Gesellschaft, we uh, set up a platform where you could download these uh, signature sheets and and basically from, from the government you get nothing. There's a small note and nothing else. So we also developed a tool to help us keep track of the paperwork um, because, and we had to develop our own because even though this software exists uh, from other parties, they didn't want to give it to us in case it fell into the wrong hands. <laughs> so now we have this uh, self-written software, which actually Patrick here developed. And uh, if you want to launch your own referendum in Switzerland, you're welcome to ask him for the software. Well, so the uh, conservative parties fought or did very, very little until the end. Um, and that was uh, quite a damper for us. We, we mobilized everything and invested a lot. But together with the Digital Society and Amnesty International, we created a, a, a video to um, explain to people what this referendum really is about. Uh, she's got so many tabs open. She, she'll find it. She'll find it. Um, but uh, yes. Uh, do not fear, Miss Miller. Um, we've got the uh, the perp. You've got him. Oh yeah, yeah. We find him. No worries. There. There's. The bike, it's still there, it's still there. Are you filming all of this? <clears throat> there. What is that? <laughs> Turn this off now. Uh, yeah, yes. I, I. <laughs> Not going to translate that. <laughs> Still looking. There we go. All right. It's not my laptop, see. So. So we were talking about the conservative parties. And to be fair, there was a core group and they did a lot. But all, all together, the conservative parties, which were helping out, only reached a third of their quota of, the, of what they promised. And that was a big problem, and it would be a big part of why we failed to get enough signatures for the referendum. We didn't know that at the time, and we talked about it, and we got a tip to hire people who go um, uh, collect signatures. But that means gathering a lot and lot of money, and that was already recognized as being a, a crucial moment. And we had to mobilize over 30,000 Swiss francs in short amount of time. But we managed, and then the next question was, who would we hire? And um, we found two organizations and a couple of students from uh, various students. But, well, we still managed, and it would be interesting to look at how Swi in Switzerland you can organize such a referendum. 
So having solved that, um, we are on the final stretch uh, and we got more and more signatures and we had people working day and night to verify those signatures and I really want to thank every single one of those people. That's big, that deserves a big, big, big thank you for all the work they put in in, in uh, verifying those signatures. Uh, we were working and it was raining and we gathered and gathered like crazy. And then we get the news that something wasn't working out. Uh, daily, uh, we, 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 we had to do a lot of work. Um, it was a nightmare. And the, the, everything was um, organized very um, broadly and, and, and agilely, and suddenly it turned into a bureaucratic monster, and there were people who wouldn't even acknowledge being connected. And that took a lot of time. And a lot of people tried to go figure out why our help was rejected. And we went there and there, there was a, it, it was a nightmare. Uh, we had contracts uh, guaranteeing a certain number of signatures and that just wasn't there. Things weren't there. We, we tried to organize everything at short notice, but some of us were even such on the shock that we really just had to sit back and, and calm down. And still, we tried and we did everything to get everything verified in time. We had to go to every little last community somewhere to the to the local governments to to get it verified, to get it... Uh, um, we, we, we had another bunch of signatures which we had to do on, on shortest notice, just before the referendum, the, before the, um, the deadline. And that was, that was very consternating. That, that, that led to a big consternation. And we didn't feel good about it. And we roughly had 55,000 signatures um, and we went and handed it in and unfortunately only 41,000 were verified and that didn't quite work out. But we are going to be invited to the next um, consultation um, in spring of 2017 and uh, we're not going to give up. We have the option of uh, a people's initiative. Um, uh, we do think that even if um, mass surveillance weakens our democracy, we can still work against it. And please, everyone, do not surrender, do not give up, stay active, protect our personal freedom online as offline and keep working. Hello. Um, I'm going to say something about against uh, about our uh, case against uh, mass surveillance. Um, so we've just heard about uh, how we use the tools of our democracy to fight against mass surveillance, but uh, we also have uh, a different approach by basically going uh, the way of the courts. So this is a, a quick summary of what metadata in Switzerland are currently collected today. So the important comparison compared to Germany is, well, you're discussing about four or eight weeks. Uh, in, in Switzerland, it's more like six months versus 12 years. Well, fortunately, we will manage to get that bit thrown out. So. So uh, we contacted the uh, service that collects the metadata for the government and asked for the data about six individual people. 
uh, this service from the government uh, didn't follow through and so we came to the uh, federal uh, court um, and uh, they discussed our case for a long time and extended the case to five judges but our notion was declined but there's uh, one good thing that happened so this is actually the first uh, legal case in Switzerland which actually says that uh, that mass surveillance is a serious offense against uh, privacy so this is what we received uh, and now for a few weeks we went uh, to the Supreme Court of Switzerland and uh, well we expect that uh, these six individual people uh, could be exempt from mass surveillance but of course that's, that's not what we want um, if if we don't get what we want in front of the uh, Supreme Court we're going to the European Human Rights uh, Court in Strasbourg and of course our goal is to free all the Swiss people from mass surveillance and uh, if we get this case in front of Strasbourg then uh, there's two possibilities for the Swiss government so they they could remove just these six people from dragnet surveillance which I mean would be technically possible but unlikely or um, the other way would be to uh, throw out the law altogether. Of course, if you remove all those six people from mass surveillance, why wouldn't you remove any others um, from mass surveillance? It stays exciting, but it's going to take some more time. We only um, moved towards the Supreme Court a few days ago, so everything of this is going to take some more time. And I think that's it for me, and I'm going to hand it over back to Patrick again. In the past few months, or years actually, the uh, magic firewalls are uh, have been keeping us busy because for politicians they are a tool to keep us all safe and in reality they look more like the image we just saw. Um, in reality we've also reached the um, gambling laws um, and the goal of these laws is to protect gamblers from themselves. All the gambling wins should be treated uh, the same. Currently, um, casinos are not uh, taxed and um, online gambling should be um, permitted and the same as has been done to uh, offline casinos should be kept. Our main criticism of this law is in fact that there are that currently they are trying to block um, non-licensed online games and that requires firewall infrastructure. Um, uh, the cantons also, that is the states of Switzerland, also benefit from this gambling, um, from lotteries. They, uh, in 2012, earned almost 600 million um, casinos paid another 320 million Swiss francs um, to um, to funds um, for into the National Pension Fund. Um, so, as said, it's supposed to protect the gamblers from themselves. Um, if I have um, such a license, um, then I must um, be able to block certain people from playing. Um, uh, we want, it's supposed to be kept lucrative, well, for the state, that is. 
ever fewer people are playing uh, the lottery because there's not an instant feedback. You buy your lottery ticket and that takes some time. But since we want to keep that, um, the goal is to prohibit newer um, models of games. Um, the fact that this is a problem in the first place is that the entire uh, internet um, branch of industry has let this slide and, and basically not realized that the uh, gambling laws would affect them at all. Then there was a consultation um, about the telecommunications law. There's a partial revision. They, they want to change certain parts of the law, not the entire law. But of course, um, even here, they want to include firewalls and blockages. Um, actually, the goal was uh, to strengthen uh, the laws of the, 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 the rights of con consumers and to uh, deregulate the usage of the telling of, of the um, ban of bandwidth um, and to um, uh, lessen the burden of administration to um, service providers. Um, the consultation is over. Um, again, our main criticism is is blocks and firewalls. Um, the fact that net neutrality is not part of the um, is not really part of the law, and no protection against uh, metadata collection. We do have some blocks already in place in Switzerland since uh, 2007. We have a blockage list um, uh, there is a self-declaration by the um, community of all providers that they um, stick with this block list. And now um, Parliament is thinking that this, um, uh, vol this blacklist is not good enough and that the voluntary aspect is not good enough and it should be that they should be forced and this list should be updated uh, every three months which as we know is way too slow for the internet and of course then there's the dark net and these DNS blocks um, are very easy to um, circumvent and I've in fact um, uh, answered the consultation by putting uh, a guide to circumvention into our answer, uh, which means it's now officially archived in the Federal Archive. So, they plan to um, force that it has to be declared uh, when things are zero rated or there are under other rated data streams and but we don't want discrimination of data streams so in in the consultation for this law the big providers uh, published a code of conduct where where they say well we do net neutrality but uh, in fact nothing changed at all basically they uh, do the same thing they do now and the last point is, well, we've uh, previously discussed this last year's session. Uh, Balthasar Gletli entered a motion into the parliament to basically put net neutrality into law, but uh, it was thrown out with the uh, because supposedly it wasn't necessary. Then our changes to what metadata is saved and also who can have information from the stored metadata. Well, we want basically that only billing relevant, metadata relevant to billing can be saved at all. And we also want that uh, the customer controls what data is stored and only the 
customer can access it so that the provider can't give the data to anyone else. Also, well, this uh, provision is also bullshit. And then there's uh, the problem with the uh, copyright law, which is um, being revised. So the idea was to have a more modern version of the copyright law and fight piracy more effectively. Uh, the, they put three strikes in there. And then they wanted to uh, promote the use of, of digital services. So uh, just, just a few uh, bits from this law. So it's currently uh, in a really bad shape. Um, many people um, commented in the consultation. There were over 1,000 uh, entities that entered their comments at the, um, and in, in all in all, uh, the report in the end that was published was 8,000 pages long. Uh, well, the, the paper they had to sift through, uh, they were uh, astoundingly fast. The, so our main point of criticism, uh, sort of touched on this already, is uh, well, uh, internet uh, filtering is part of this law do. So let's say uh, take down and stay down notices, this is going to be formalized. So this means uh, if you receive a take down notice, you have to ensure that this bit of uh, information can't be published again. So there are um, ideas there to criminalize the customers and then there are kind of uh, access rights. So, um, for example, if a user has been warned three times, then a judge can access the metadata from this user. So, um, this is a bit of the backstory. Um, 2012, uh, from pressure from the music industry from the US, um, a working group was started. I mean, that's the, the general approach when you actually don't want to do anything. So there were regular uh, meetings um, from this working group. The, the protocols are public online, by the way, um, from Swiss uh, internet politics. Barely anyone was invited, uh, maybe one or two of the big ones, but uh, not not really any relevant representation, so they met over and over again until November 2015, where the uh, public consultation was started. Uh, with the public consultation, everybody has three months' time to study the law and, and enter a comment. And, well, if you're a big party, you can also ask for an extension if you uh, miss this three-month deadline. So the uh, Swiss Democratic Party did that, for example. Usually, when a, a consultation is open or, or completed, then um, the results are analyzed uh, internally, and then there is a summary report. And here, there was, however, a meeting of this Augur 12 group, and uh, through a Freedom of Information Act request, um, we were able to access uh, the meeting minutes and we found out that they had access to the report that was supposed to be public but they had access to it earlier which is not okay so um, a lot of uh, individuals also libraries and uh, uh, commented that it's uh, stupid that there's a, a fee that libraries have to pay now in this proposed law, for example. Um, there's the Institut für Geistiges Eigentum, part of the federal government, of the administration, and they said, well, basically reform is, is good, they said, but um, of course um, everyone has different opinions about how this reforms should be made. So, officially, there is still time until the summer for this working group to decide how to uh, move forward with this law. So, all, as I've said, all the data on the public proceedings you can find under this link. So, um, I've made a summary of 
what we want. So we want, don't want any net bans. Um, we want to keep uh, downloads not being illegal as it currently is. So, I mean, the revision won't explicitly criminalize the downloads, but uh, uh, you have to kind of uh, balance it out in, in the other direction. So we really want to have that in there explicitly. Then we want the right to have information. Uh, we want to remove the um, uh, rights of Verwertungsgesellschaften to access records on normal people. Then uh, if if take their notices will remain in the law, we want to have uh, penalties for abusing uh, the sending of takedown notices. Then the administration of the Verwaltungsgesellschaften is, is way too big. We want to lower that down to 10% and you shouldn't have to uh, pay fees explicitly to the Verwertungsgesellschaften. So you have to, uh, musicians should be able to basically sell their own music directly without um, delegating the rights to the Verwertungsgesellschaft. There is a very big problem with unclear copyright situation um, on works where the author uh, can't be found or has died. And of course, um, we are also considering uh, things that are uh, things like movies as well, which um, yeah, we've talked about three strikes. Um, works um, uh, that are made by public um, uh, offices or the administration should not be covered under copyright um, and uh, you should be protected from responsibility so that free Wi-Fi access points are possible too. Well, uh, data protection, it might not be sexy, but it's damn necessary. So what's it about specifically? Since several decades, we've had a data protection law in Switzerland, and we've been thinking about modernizing that. There is a um, official who is in charge of data protection and um, public law. And he can tell companies that do not care about data protection, um, that they're being bad companies. And we have a um, fairly weak um, data protection law, despite everybody um, praising the data protection laws in Switzerland. In, in the pinch, it really doesn't go that far. How should I put this? Um, there is a certain set of data which um, uh, of, which ad, the administration uh, can work on, and um, I should be able to uh, keep um, my rights about this data, and I should be able to ask for that data from company or administration. Um, and these companies and, and administration um, should not be able to uh, sell that um, data to someone, unlike here in, Switz in, in Germany, where um, uh, poor um, communities can sell data to earn some extra money. Um, the last one lasted for 23 years, so we're assuming that the new data protection law will last for quite a while. And uh, the consultation is now running si since a few days ago, and um, we expect that it will ask for more power for law enforcement and the administration. And we expect that it will orient itself in the uh, EU data protection law. And um, 
eine Firma, welche sich nicht im EU-Raum befindet, beispielsweise die Schweizer Firma so, um, wenn die ein Produkt nach Deutschland liefert, dann äh, gilt der Datenschutz ebenso in diesem Ort. So, they expect the, to use the um, market locating principle so that when a Swiss company um, uh, sells something in Germany, it, it, the German law also applies, and so our law would also apply to companies selling in Switzerland. Um, I can um, should be able to take my data with me and give it to another um, company if I want to and be in control. Um, there's also the uh, European Council Convention and um, the central element there is the consent to um, data manipulation. And if a company does not conform to data protection laws, then there should be um, uh, automatic um, notification and um, appropriate laws. And that still runs until April, and, and we will um, make sure to um, fight for our stance in, in that, and we'll see what comes from that. And for the end, I just want to quickly talk about e-voting. At this time, um, there are two systems in Switzerland which are being evaluated, used as an evaluation. And basically, the, 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 the federal government has argued for using e-voting to make it easier for Switzerlands who live abroad um, to vote in Swiss votes. Um, and currently it's limited to a certain percentage of voters. And these two systems could not be more different. Currently there is a closed source Spanish system which is being offered by the Swiss post office, the mail, and then there is a open sourced version which the canton of Geneva uh, is developing. Unfortunately, on universal verificability is not a given in either of the systems. Um, and the goal is to have e-voting established in two-thirds of all cantons in uh, 2019. But keep in mind that in, 25, in 2005, somebody wrote that we should have it by 2010, and then they said in 2013, and then they said 2017, so it'll take some time. But basically it boils down to this. Um, my political views, how I vote, who I elect, is part of my privacy, and that's difficult in e-voting. We have to be sure that my vote was counted, and not just that it was counted, but that it was counted the way I wanted it to. And, and we can say the devil is in the details with e-voting, and it's difficult, if not impossible, impossible to um, create a data protection um, compliant uh, e-voting system. There is individual verifi verifiabil verifiability. I, as a citizen, should be able to verify that uh, the system was counted and entered into the system appropriately. If I vote on paper, I can not go through the ballot box and confirm which one um, that mine was counted. But, of course, I can just go to my community and join and help with the counting and observe. And I can see that the process is working fine, and that's good enough, because if the process is working, my vote was counted appropriately. And it would be nice if that was ca the case with e-voting too. As I said, there's three points. Was my vote um, cast as intended? Was it recorded as cast? And was it counted as it was recorded? In America, a few weeks ago, there was a recount, and oh, the, uh, the technician's in the house. 
In America, a few weeks ago, there was a recount of the election. And in the regions where e-voting computers have been used, um, of course, there's a difference. E-voting is about I vote from home and with election computers, I go to the office and use the machine there. But there's no paper and I cannot actually do a recount. I can verify my database, I can, I can rebuild my database, but that requires a paper trail to uh, actually verify the vote. There are some inherent problems. E-voting is very complex. It's not um, understandable to the average user. I can't explain that to my grandmother, how it works. If you don't know cryptography and know it well, you're not going to have a chance to understand it. And of course, then there's bring your own device. Um, all devices can be on different patch levels. They can ha have various malware infect them. And this is always going to be a problem with e-voting. It's not necessarily a problem of e-voting as such, but it's a problem of the computers which will be used to do e-voting. And, of course, even a perfectly um, designed system can still be implemented incorrectly. And, of course, that means the code, and generally the code would have to be open sourced and audited by an independent, um, uh, independent instance. And the Canton of Geneva um, is being progressive here. And um, there is a Spanish solution, but the Canton of Geneva is uh, working on an open source um, solution which can be found at this GitHub code, the GitHub repo. So further components will be added to the system. It's in generally very good that the Canton of Geneva developing this thing and also helps other cantons develop this system to their needs. So that was it. Um, thank you for taking the time and <laughs> thanks for all the Swiss people being here especially. So there are two things uh, on the chaos side um, and the other thing is uh, from the Digital Society Switzerland we write a newsletter once a month to sum up with what has happened in Switzerland. So I uh, really um, want to recommend you to sign up to this newsletter to know what's going on. So you can contact us at the Congress if you want to talk to us. You can see here. And uh, of course, I'm uh, here to answer some questions uh, if you have any. And uh, so in in but right after this, after Hall 1, if you go uh, back to Hall 1, that's below the food court, uh, we got a room and we can have a chat about Netzpolitik in Switzerland. And we'd be really glad if you show up there. But of course, uh, right after this talk, you'll, you'll have another very interesting um, session in this room and of course but I want I would like uh, the Swiss people to please come to work workshop and uh, everyone else please follow the talk about uh, Netzpolitik in, in Austria so question from the audience. So, to Sabrina, you, you said something about that referendum before. Uh, you said there was some sabotage with the part of the signature. So, uh, what's up with that? Were, were those saboteurs or were those just people trying to make a quick buck? Well, this is a question uh, we've we've asked ourselves there are some very emotional responsible uh, the the correct response i can give you is uh, these are people who made a contract with us and 
they told us that they had these numbers and, and in fact maybe they were simply just overwhelmed by the talks and, and we can't really say anything as to their motives. So. I would like to ask about the data protection law. Um, I'm surprised, actually very surprised, because I have a little bit to do with that and been dealing with this for quite some time, that Switzerland seems to be having this highly backwards law up to now. And how did that happen? Um, how, how come Switzerland is behind on that part of law? Well, generally you can say that Switzerland works, but it works slowly. Direct democracy is exhausting and it takes a lot of time. That's one part of the answer, of course. And the other is we've realized after 23 years that yes, actually, you know, we can extend data protection. I don't know where you were 23 years ago, but internet used to be a lot slower back then. And I do think it's actually kind of nice that now we've decided to um, strengthen our data protection and uh, also our main data protector. And I mean, I've said his competences is basically recommendations and giving him the right to actually um, uh, punish people that's a good thing, and, and data protection needs to have a real bite. So, a note here. Um, we ha we've heard some complaints about e-voting, and uh, I do research on this topic. So, yeah, there are definitely a few problems, um, and I can't personally find out which code, which program was installed there and that it really only does what I want, but uh, there are a few things that actually are problems that have been solved. So, for example, the end-to-end -end encryption thing, there is such a thing as end-to-end -end verification. So, there are some risks, but uh, in, in other societies they have decided to accept some risk uh, for technical development and I want you to invite you all to an assembly uh, tomorrow at 4.15 uh, p.m. and I'm going to explain some of the uh, issues that have been solved with e-voting. Where is this assembly? It's uh, in Hall G if it's not changed. So there are going to be a number of uh, talks about decentralized networking and we're all, we'll also cover e-voting. Um, I'm more interested in the revision of um, copyright law. Is there the intention to work together with artists? Because I'm pretty sure I know a couple of people who will be against that revision and probably quite a few more artists who would be against copyright law if they understood it, understood it. And are there efforts in that direction? And I think that's a voice where you couldn't argue for protecting the artists if the artists were against it. What I can tell you is that we have worked together with an artist for the uh, communiques of the Pirate Party, but we will gladly get back to you. But the problem is that a lot of these are organized in um, in groups, and these groups are really close to um, industry, uh, even if the artists themselves aren't. I have another question. What's your position on Trojans? Um, not um, computers, but implants. Um, uh, pacemakers, insulin pumps, hearing aids. Why, why do you think there's a difference in, in this one negative aspect? Well, if I have a Bluetooth uh, 
deactivatable pacemaker, somebody dies. If I, you know, uh, if I deny a, a computer, then, well, the computer is off, unless that computer controls something. Well, thank you for answering that question. Um, what's your position on that? I don't know if that's going to make a lot of sense, but here goes. It's a question I haven't thought about a lot. Um, at its most basic, uh, a hearing aid I can remove, pacemaker I can't. Pacemakers are, as far as I know, you can calibrate them uh, over radio, but you have to be really close. At the same time, we know that in RFID, um, distance is a relative thing. Um, I think really first one or two people are probably going to have to die before a debate gets going on that. At its more base basic, everybody has to decide if they want to be a cyborg. And yes, I, looking at it this way, a pacemaker is being part machine assisted. Um, definitely an interesting question, but I think first we have to have a few incidents before we get any sort of debate on that. But it's a, it's a really interesting question. So, thanks. Okay, uh, last question from me. Um, so, I have diabetes and I have a ins uh, had an insult point at some point. So, Switzerland has a lot of uh, pharma industry, so I'm um, sure they have a lot of good solutions to this problem and uh, I can also look at my uh, blood sugar on my phone and in the cloud. Are, are you up to date how these pharma companies protect your data? Well, we mentioned this before, we were invited by the National Health Service to consult on the law about the uh, uh, digital uh, patient dossier and uh, file. Yeah. So you find information about this on the CCC page of Switzerland or of the Zurich section. Further questions? In an earlier talk about um, forcing routers on, on customers, um, it was said that if you want to fight it, um, you have to present alternatives. Talking about um, gambling, online gambling, um, we're against the DNS blocks, but um, do you have an alternative on protecting people and on um, providing the tax returns? Because both of these are wanted, right? Well, so how should we say this? Um, Currently, you're supposed to get a, a license, which is a good step, because um, that um, uh, already means you have a certain duty, and the illegal offerings, well, they'll always be there, and there's nothing to be done about that, not even with DNS blocking. Uh, and, well, there are many things we've thought about. Um, apart from classic um, net blockers, um, you could delist them from uh, f from search engines. But really, the more important thing is to um, to stop the flow of money, not the uh, not censor the net. But just to be right, um, this isn't about illegal. Um, uh, games as such, but about non-Swiss uh, companies. Um, the point is to keep the profits in Switzerland, and censoring the net is definitely the wrong th way to do this. And we showed them different ways to deal with this, but beginning of January is when we're going to see how successful we were. Uh, one last short question, please, if possible. Okay, I'll try. So, in net politics, uh, everything's uh, going to shit right now. And 
you said uh, you want to try to change some things with less inputs, but uh, I mean, realistically, probably uh, nothing is going to happen. So the question is, are we really planning to or, I mean, do we have uh, the possibility to start from zero again? So we haven't actually talked about uh, a new public referendum. We just haven't talked about this yet. And so just to um, go over this again, at the beginning we were few, now we are many, and we started um, clearing up technical details with members of parliament and th this is also something that's a movement that's still growing. We have to invest the time first until we see some changes. And But I think everyone that really wants to play a part in this really should go ahead and do that. And uh, please come forward and talk to us. Actually, there there is one referendum that's uh, on the table and uh, well first uh, I think we have to catch our breath before we really move forward or something this big so thank you uh, Patrick Sabrina and Simon for your talk uh, warm round of applause